The Taycan is one of the few EVs that really gets our hearts racing with first the brilliant sedan version that's a super fast saloon and then the off-roading capable Cross Turismo. But Porsche may have created the Goldilocks version here, melding both the sporty side of our sedan and the more practical side of the Cross Turismo into this sleek and awesome looking Sport Turismo variant. And in my estimation, it's the best looking of the bunch. And why not more variants? I mean, just this last quarter, the Taycan accounted for almost 10% of total Porsche sales worldwide, which is damn impressive. And in that quarter, it beat all of its German rivals and for the first time beat the Model S in sales. And that's a pretty damn good achievement. But it's not just variants we're getting. The other thing I want to talk to you about today is the future electric cars that are coming in the near future from Porsche. So stay tuned for that in the episode as well. Today, we're gonna to test the ST properly on the road. I'm gonna share with you the shocking performance of this humble 4S. I'm gonna show you every detail of the car, how it works, what makes it what it is, and then my own experience living with my car for the past six months, what it's been like. So let's dive in and review this. Porsche's Taycan Sport Turismo. So guys, Porsche say that by 2025, 50% or more of their sales will come from either hybrid or electric cars, and then by 2030, 80%. And this should be of no surprise to you because their biggest sellers, which are their SUVs, are due to become EVs within that time period. And I will, of course, fill you in on that later in the video. And this doesn't surprise me either. If I look at myself personally as a Porsche customer, I did not buy this car because it was a good EV. I bought it because it was a damn exciting car. The propulsion took a back seat in the decision. Now, the great thing about the ST is that dynamically speaking, it is identical to the sedan version of the car, which is damn good going considering that we've got extra body added to the car and most wagons that do that end up slower and heavier. Now, what makes the Taycan and thus the Sports Turismo so good is that Porsche's goal was to make a really good sports car and everything that they've done on this car really echoes that mission statement. So at the heart of it, we've got the 800 volt electric system and then a performance battery that sits as low as possible with the foot garages so that you're able to sit low down like a sports car, like the 911. Little considerations like that, meaning a lot to the customer. In terms of the battery, you either have a 79 kilowatt one or a 93 kilowatt performance plus, which makes sure you have to get, be it for performance or range, do not buy the standard battery version that links to your two speed gearbox and that of course links to permanently synchronous electric motors either one or two depending on the Taycan variant but I found having driven all of them that the Goldilocks was in fact the humble 4S it has 435 brake horsepower 5 to 2 on overboost then a 0 to 60 of 3.8 seconds and of course, above that, you have the GTS, which might seem more like the Goldilocks car, but A, it's heavier, and B, when I tested the 4S Cross Turismo, it was going as fast on launch control as the GTS, and I found this car to be as dynamic. So we're gonna see. We're gonna see when we drive it. I'm convinced that this is the Goldilocks. Let's see what happens on the drive later. Now, the Sport Turismo also gets air suspension as standard, but it does not get the performance battery as standard like the Cross Turismo, so watch out on that. And that means that all the option packages that you'd get on the sedan are also available on the Sport Turismo. So all those wheel options, all the design options, etc., you can kind of make it the way you want, whereas the Cross Turismo, a little bit more restrictive. For example, on my car, I got the GTS design wheels, or the RS design as they call it. So these are the same as you get on the GTS, I did not like the standard finish though, which was the two-tone, silver and black. So I decided to change it to a look that was a more Porsche and a bit more GTS. And for that, I went to the guys at Whoops Wheels. And I have to plug them for this because they did just a phenomenal job with some state-of-the-art equipment. So first, they, I've always seen wheels get dipped in acid machines, but instead their strip tank, which is the only one in the country, self cleans the paint out of the machine and is just much better at stripping. The wheels then go to the shop blasting machine to key the wheels and it's done in mere minutes instead of like 20 minutes being done by hand and is ready for painting. And then finally, their track conveyor powder coating system, which is basically the closest that you can get powder coating to OEM finish. Just finish the wheels in an incredible way 
and the results really just speak for themselves. It's the nicest silver finish I've ever seen on a wheel. Uh, I just absolutely love it. And I think it actually looks better than the GTS does. Now, I promise you some news about the future of Porsche electric cars. Let's start first by talking about the Macan EV. This sits on an all new platform, which is called the PPE platform. And I think it's gonna be a massive seller. Last year, Porsche sold over 300,000 cars. And you won't believe 80,000 plus of those were Macans, okay? And now the Macan is gonna be EV only on this new PPE platform. What is this platform? It's being jointly developed with Audi. I think the future Q6 is gonna use it, but Porsche have their own flavor. Still 800 volt electrical system like the Taycan using a 100 kilowatt battery, apparently having stuff like rear wheel steer that the Macan has not had in the past. Um, but the thing here that they've done, which is a bit unique, and I think it depends on the model that you go for, they've got something called a performance rear axle where the electric motor and your rear diff and your, your axle is set a, a bit further back on the car and it gives a weight distribution of 52.48, so a bit rear biased. In addition to that, they're having different width wheels on the front and the rear for those models to make them, you know, the grip a little bit more sportive. This is quite interesting stuff. And I'm quite pleased that Porsche are taking the Macan EV very seriously in terms of performance SUV, because that car is really meant to be that, isn't it? And we've seen it running around the Nürburgring. Then Porsche's active suspension management system gets a, a two valve shock absorber, whether you get the air suspension or the steel suspension, it's rumored to have, which is gonna make the car even more dynamic in terms of you know, how it's running. So that's interesting. I think that's gonna be a big seller. Um, Design-wise, we can see some, some slim Taycan facelift style lights and underneath that further lights. They're hiding a lot of this though, but you know, a very Macan shape. It's gonna be interesting. Then of course, the Cayenne will get its EV version that sits above this as well. And apparently that might be seven seats. So let's see, lots, lots coming in the future from Porsche in terms of EVs and, and the SUVs. But the other cornerstone of this company is of course, small sports cars. And we know that the 718 EV is around the corner. We've seen the concept that they were showing us now. We only have very little rumor information about this vehicle itself. Does it sit on the PP platform or something different, unique to Porsche? I'm guessing maybe the latter. Um, from what we've heard, it's gonna have a number of variants. It's definitely EV, despite the fact that you see fake exhausts on the rear. There is a charging port right in the middle of the rear bumper. There's gonna be multiple versions. I think the entry level one will have a single motor on the rear for some rear driven action. I think your motors and your batteries will sit on the rear to give that kind of mid engine feeling to this thing as well. I think you'll get lots of different sports electric sounds, hopefully within this as well. And then like a GTS or a higher version will probably be dual motor. So one on the front, one on the rear. These are the educated guesses that everybody is making about this car at the moment. I'm very excited about it. I think they'll do a coupe as well, like a Cayman you know, type version as well. And it could be, you know, the prime, the prime sports electric car. In terms of range, I don't know, maybe 200 if we're lucky, because it's gonna have a smaller battery, but we will see. Right, now back to Taycan, back to Taycan. Um, one future point on Taycan is that they are testing a crazy thousand horsepower Taycan GT, and presumably to once again destroy the Tesla after their, um, uh, let's say, slightly suspect attempt on the Nürburgring. Um, is that something that any of us are really interested in? Do we care about a Taycan GT? I don't know, but it seems to be coming in the facelift. We shall see. Let's get back to the Goldilocks car. It's a fantastic car. I wanna show you inside and then my experience living with it. But before that, some notes about charging this car, which is really half the trick of owning one of these. So my friends, as you know, charging at home is half the trick when it comes to actually owning an EV, because it's the only really easy way to do this thing. And I'm still using the same charger company that was previously, and this is the Porsche recommended one here in the UK, which is Anderson Chargers, and this is the Anderson A2. So this is the newer one that I've got now, and unlike my previous one that had the metal face and like a grey side, this time I spec'd up a totally different look, which is a sand covering, so a sand body, and this lovely wood finish instead of the metal one. And when you look at it like next to the house, it's great because like, you can spec that the way you want it to be. And you can actually spec a load of different looks as well. So you can, like I said, have a different colored body and they've got all different colors of the metal doors. And now they've even released a carbon fiber one as well. Now the other awesome, awesome thing about the Anderson chargers, you might be wondering, where is the wire to charge the car? Well, the amazing thing is 
you're able to hide it within the box. So this literally wraps around here and you can then conceal it by folding it away like so. And then it just pops in the top when you're done using it. And it's a nice seamless tucked away charger, which is brilliant. In terms of charging power, this is a single phase unit. So it gives me seven kilowatts all the time, which is actually really, really good. Keeps the Taycan filled up, gives it a good boost of power even in a few hours as well. And it's been really reliable. And you can check the app if there's ever any errors or what the charging power is as well. So you don't need to rely on your manufacturer's app either. So as you know, if you really want to own an EV and make it easy, you need to have a charger at home. So this one, my second unit now, can't recommend it enough. Anderson have been brilliant. So I'm a big fan of the Taycan interior. I think as far as EVs go, it's the one that's really the most familiar to our traditional cars and less alienating. And that's such a key thing, I think, bringing us old dinosaurs into the world of EVs is keeping things familiar. For example, the curved driver zone behind the wheel here, much like 911 in the same type of shape with your three circles and then the, the bits that you can't see behind the steering wheel, which is a very classic Porsche. Um, but this is without information overload. It's a very simple design. I think too simple. And from what I've seen from the new Cayenne, they've upped their game on the digital side. I'm excited to see that, but it needs that because it is very simple, but familiar, not information overload, blink and you know squint and you might think that it's an analog Porsche dial from the past. And that's quite cool. The shape is nice. It's in this nice cocoon here. And that's all great. Your steering wheel, normal Porsche steering wheel, drive modes, normal handles from 911. Um, it gets a bit different here, but you have your sports chrono uh, clock over there. The screens, again, once you get used to it, it's really not overload. Your lower screen here for your climate, your heated seats, a few shortcuts here and there. That's it. There's nothing else going on here. It's really easy and you've got a little touchpad in there as well. Should you want to use a touchpad with haptic feedback instead of tapping that, which is a good option to have. Uh, the main screen, it's okay. It's small, it's similar to 911 again. Small touch points, which I find a little bit annoying. But again, not information overload. It's not a big ass, you know, <laughs> Mercedes hyper screen or something. That is just way too much going on. It's familiar. It works. Passenger screen, do away with. Never need it. Never ever going to need it. At the moment, it's just useless. You get over the over the air updates, which is great. What I found to be good is function on demand. We've always moaned about how manufacturers are putting stuff into cars, then making you pay for it as a subscription later. Taycan is a time when this actually works because as you guys know, Porsche have this huge options list, right? And you can increase the cost of your car exponentially using that. What they're doing here, for example, I wanted to have self-driving in, in this car, but instead of buying it beforehand, the car comes with many of the radars already installed and all I need to do is use the function on demand service online, buy Eno Drive and Lane Assist, and I pay a monthly subscription of around about 30 pounds a month for that. And as soon as I'm done with the car, I just cancel it. And that's way better than having an outlay of say 1,000 to 1,500 pounds on day one, because I'm gonna be paying way less and only paying for it when I use it. So this is a use case where function on demand is actually a really good idea, as long as the cost of your car is cheaper because of it. Otherwise, you know, that entire idea can go in the bin. Range has been very similar to my Cross Turismo. So in the winter, we're looking at just over 200 miles. Right now, as we're getting into the summer, it's closer to 230, 240, which is pretty good. And with that charging, as I mentioned, I'm always, you know, topped up in the morning, which I love in a performance car. And I'm just not used to as a petrol head. So all of that is working really well. I spec this interior a bit different to my Cross Turismo. So it's got some nice contrast with the crayon and the black, and I've loved living with that. And remember to get the four plus one seats. If you want the full three seat rear bench, it does not come standard. And it's really important that you do get that if you care about space in a wagon. Um, the rear again has been great for kids, car seats, and we will talk about the boot now. So guys, here is the boot of our ST. You can see we have this luggage load cover here. This is removable and it can actually be stored behind the rear seat, which is great. And then you can use the hooks and there's four of them, as I'll show you now on each side for like hanging luggage and stuff, which is cool. Then we've got these extra straps in order to again, tie down your luggage, which is great. A few cubby holes in here on each side, lots of storage, 12 volt, and another bit of storage at the bottom here. And of course, you've got split folding back there as per usual to give you even more space. And this is a good 40 liters more than your standard Taycan in case you're curious. And then one thing you won't get in any combustion car, which is of course storage in the front, which is where I put 
the Porsche official charger and a detailing bag. So again, that's really useful for any other type of storage that you might want to put that you can't fit in the back. So very spacious, very practical, exactly the same increases in head height and rear space as you get in the Cross Turismo, absolutely identical, no difference to that. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You get the practicality of the Cross with the nice low stance and position of the saloon and hopefully the dynamics as I'm gonna show you now when we go out for a drive. All right, my friends, let's start off with a bang, with a launch control. The tires are really new. The conditions are absolutely perfect. Let's see what this humble 4S can do on launch. I'm excited to see this, particularly after my Cross Turismo was so quick. Oh, it's always so quick. Oh, 3.5 seconds. That is quick. And as last time, the same speed that we got out of the Taycan GTS. And really, I mean, that's matching all the super saloons of today. You know, the RS6, M5, E63, a little bit faster actually. Those two easily get to 3.2. But for a humble 4S, that's amazing. And speed is just one of those things that as a Taycan driver, it just comes standard in every model. Even the rear wheel drive one, which sometimes feels a little bit underpowered, it's still really, really quite quick. And that's because you don't have a traditional gearbox that's going through gears in order to get you to the power that you want to be at. You just get the full torque and the full horsepower if you're in the right mode, you know, straight away. And the real world benefit of that is when you want to take an opportunity, like you see a gap in the traffic or you want to shoot off from a junction, the car enables you to do that. You have the confidence that it's just going to work immediately and give you the power that you need. Unlike you know, most combustion cars where sometimes you get a bit of lag, sometimes the gearbox isn't quite as responsive. Here, you don't have any of that, particularly thanks to the fact that this is a 4S, you get all the grip in the world and the power is performing so well, you can't help but marvel at it. And that's the case even in normal mode that I will actually use 90% of the time. And the thing is it kind of spoils you because you get all this fantastic speed and power. And then when you go into other more traditional combustion or hybrid cars, you're less kind of disappointed by the laggy response that those forms of propulsion now give you. I sound like a complete EV convert, and I promise you in this regard, I really am. But that immediately accessible speed betrays Porsche's mission statement with Taycan, like we said, which was from the off to make a really, really good sports car. And that at the heart of it is what it is. It cares less about range. It cares more about instant performance, rep repeatable performance, which is so important. You can do those launch controls as many times as you want. So even if your charge level is low, you're not gonna be nannied into having less power like a lot of manufacturers do. Now the other thing I love about Taycan is their electric sports sound. And I can turn it on and off from here. And at the moment, the sound you've been hearing has just been the car's normal mode. Now, when you pop it into sport, it's interesting that they've actually built in the change of the two-speed gearbox when it shifts, shifts up a gear, if you like. Um, and that's quite nice. The GTS introduced it, but it's in the rest of the Taycans. So I'm in normal and you can hear the hum. Now I'll switch into sport. Did you hear that? So it does like this little upshifty type sound. And that upshift, downshift within your two-speed gearbox is always audible when you have the electric sports sound on as well. So you as the driver, it's nice just to have the feedback of what is going on mechanically. I always say, A, it's safe, and B, it's exciting for the driver when you're, you know, former petrol head, if you like, to have those little indications of what is going on in the skin. I love that. What I've noticed while living with the car as well is that the sound of sport versus normal is actually a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit you know, more powerful, and that's not something that they were doing before, um, at least not that I noticed. So that's nice, so you can have a, a bit of a stronger sound in sport and then something a bit more sedate in normal. However, I do think they're lagging behind the competition in this, BMW and Mercedes, particularly now having so many soundscapes that you can choose from, some that you might not like, some that you might really like, and then more downloadable ones. Considering that Porsche were the first to really do this properly, I would like to see them double down on this and really give more options to their customers because they already do it so well. 
Now, in order to tackle some handling, we're going to put the car into sport mode, which will activate the sport chassis, put the car in the lowest in terms of the air suspension as well, and that exciting sound, and make everything a bit more rigid. And like I said, we haven't got Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus in this, haven't got rear wheel steer either. I don't think you need it. The car's really dynamic. I mean, oh my God. Predictably and rather boringly, it handles like a Porsche, which means it handles bloody well. <laughs> it is unbelievable, this thing. The way that it just, A, the feedback you get as a driver from the steering is unbelievable. It is akin to every other Porsche that you'll drive. And I know that's a really boring thing to say because they're all so brilliant. And that's what differentiates this car to the others. The speeds that you can get at just through corners as well is mind blowing. But it's more about the feedback. Like I said, you get through the wheel. I know exactly where my wheels are. I know where they're pointing. I could do the whole thing with fingertips. That's the confidence that the Taycan brings you. And it's what really stands out for me when I start pushing this car along and driving faster. That and then of course it's seemingly otherworldly ability to hide its weight. And I don't know how it does it. I mean, the limits of understeer come way, way later than you expect. And it never just feels that heavy in the corners. When I compare it to big and heavy hybrids, even from Porsche, like Porsche's Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid, that feels way heavier, even though it still handles quite well. And it's all thanks to A, having the weight nice and low, but B, this platform for this car being built, like I said, to be a really proper sports sedan. Living daily with it, the upshot of all of this is you've got this crazy sports wagon, you know, at the flick of a switch, but then equally, you go back to normal mode, and it's this just really comfortable, luxury saloon experience. I can do things, you know, that just relax me and I can do long journeys without tiring out. Particularly now with function and demand that I've added the self-driving Eno drive, I can just click that on and essentially relax on longer or shorter journeys with the car being clever enough to kind of drive itself. And what I love about the Porsche one that is better than all the others that I've tried is that it is genuinely intelligent when you come to turns, roundabouts, corners, it properly begins to slow down in anticipation of turning and handles that whole element of not just driving in straight lines much better than everyone else has from my personal experience and I've tried all the big boys. And it's, it's not as intrusive, it's not as nannying in terms of begging you to hold the steering wheel, etc. It's also nice that the actual icon's very clear for me to see when the lane assist is working, when the assisted steering is working, it comes both in the screen here and in the heads up up there as well. And then it becomes as pleasurable to drive slow as it is to drive fast. You can knock off the sport sound if you want, you know, for a bit more quiet. The suspension is really clever and, and the adaptive element of the air suspension works really well. And like I said, for me, 90% of driving this car is driving it in normal mode. It gives me the power when I need it, but I really enjoy actually driving this car slowly. It does get firm sometimes, and that's no surprise because, like I said, I'm firmly in the camp that this is a sports car. However, never to the point of being uncomfortable. I think it's perfectly fine. The family has enjoyed it as well. And then if you want a bit more comfort and a bit more of a family car, you go for the Cross Turismo that always sits a bit higher, feels a bit softer. Um, it's, it's varying levels, it's nothing major. But if you really value that, then Cross Turismo is your answer. Otherwise, like I said, this reminds me of any really good luxury saloon. What I'd like to see in the future is then building upon the recuperation modes. At the moment, there's only one where you tap it on and it begins to slowly break a little bit. And that is it, it's either on or off. And that's the only level it goes to. Whereas we know with other manufacturers, you have no varying levels of recuperation, including one pedal driving, etc. which I think the whole Taycan experience could really benefit from. I've seen people like Mercedes using the paddles to activate that element, which I felt was really natural as well. So I think there is some work to be done on that element. In terms of the sportive side of it though, which is I think, like I said, I bought this not because it was a great EV. I bought it because it was a great car and I love driving it and I missed it when I didn't drive it. And that is the key of what Porsche have done with the Taycan. It's got that sold electrified that they were marketing. That paired on with the fact that you still get a 230 mile range, which is absolutely decent for a car that is so, so powerful. And when you compare it directly to things like E63, M5, etc., you've got a car that's basically as quick, but then 
when you drive it like a lunatic like I am all day and come back and put it on charge, you wake up in the morning and it's 100% again. And only customers who've owned those Ilka performance cars with huge, huge engines will understand just how cool that is to come back to your super wagon and it is ready to go without having to throw in another 100 bills. And that is something that you can put a price on. Having driven it so spiritedly across two models now, I don't think you need rear wheel steer. I don't think you need to plonk the money into Porsche Talk Rectoring Plus either. It is for daily use, for country roads, for blasting around at unreasonable speeds and making crazy directional changes. It's doing it without any of those additional systems. Um, I think those are really Porsche flexing just how good they can do it if you really want to do it. But I think for the average buyer, it's not really good. So as always, six months later, I'm left massively impressed by Taycan and actually really hopeful for Porsche's future with electrification. I can see them with the rumors on the Macan really focusing once again on the sporty side, which I'm so happy to see. The 718 EV, I have high hopes for. Um, it can be make or break for the entire sports car EV segment. I'm not trying to be dramatic, but if Porsche can't get it right in a Cayman boxster shaped car, then we are all screwed. But again, driving this and having it be so exciting and emotional, which everything else is missing, really does give me hope. So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this, what I guess is a medium to long term review of my own Porsche Sport Turismo Taycan. And as always, if you've enjoyed, please do like and subscribe to RBR. Appreciate the support and I'll see you guys next time.